you. Hi, I'm Lucas Risotto. I make VR, AR, MR, XR stuff, or whatever it's called the next year. And um, my projects have varied a lot in nature. I've done stuff for the HoloLens, for smartphones, for a um, number of virtual reality headsets. And the, the most recent of which, which was called Where Thoughts Go, which is a social narrative that premiered at Tribeca last month. And it's been known to make, uh, for making people cry, actually about 20% of people. Um, and we, we started to, we bumped into some of these principles by accident, and I would like to share them with you. But before talking about emotion in general, I'm just going to talk about emotional design. The thing that really gets me up in the morning is just I am chasing a feeling, is I want to make things that push people to do things with technology that they never thought they would ever do before. I'm always going after that high, and that means that Emotional reactions are my guiding principle. It's the, really the thing that I, my North Star for everything that I make. And I actually, I think like in a landscape like XR in which there's no um, really manual on how to do things and everything's so chaotic and confusing, I feel like the one thing you can rely on is emotional interactions. If people feel strongly about something you've made, you're onto something especially if you're trying to do new things. There's countless people that want to disrupt old industries with XR, but I want to create new markets and find new classes of things. So I think that emotional really shows you the path to the unimaginable. And that if you want to gain a native understanding of the medium, like an intuitive understanding, you do so by learning what makes people tick, learning what makes people react emotionally to the things you show them. So in designing for emotion, um, I, I look at it just as like emotion design is just like the art of designing sensory input to obtain and maximize a larger emotional state. So we um, as, and this is, I'm going to talk about VR for a moment, but this is going to be applying to AR in, in like a couple years. But we have, uh, at our disposal, we have haptics and we have sound. Um, so touch, sound, and we have visuals as well. And we're able to design all of those things plus the interactions to get people to feel stuff. And I like to look at the brain as an API. Really what we're doing is that we're designing sensorial inputs that's gonna get processed by the brain and that's going to give you a certain emotional, app, uh, emotional response. Um, and anything from, and that could be a neutral response, that could be a tear, or that could be you laughing, or that could be anything. And this cycle of you designing sensory input that gets processed by you and makes you feel something creates a relationship. And I think this is a really important point that we're not designing software anymore. We're designing a relationship between you and content and that is only powered by software. And the relationship is a foundation for everything, for how people are gonna feel about what you've made, for, um, and I actually think that w with XR, we're go walking towards a new um, type of economy as like right now we're in an attention economy and I think we're gonna start shifting to an experience economy in which people are gonna be thinking about um, choosing products that make them feel certain things more than just caring about utility alone. And the relationship you design really def uh, changes uh, w the, the outcome. It defines whether you're going to be fearful of, uh, whether people are going to be fearful of what you've made, or if they're going to laugh with it, or if they're going to fall in love with it. And when someone walks into an experience, VR or otherwise, they have no idea what you've prepared for them. You're literally, like for a moment, you're like, their God, and they don't know how to trust you. They don't know the dynamics between the world they're in and um, themselves, so they always walk with their shields up. And through emotional design, hopefully you get that shield down and you create a relationship between both. So how much time do I have? Okay, cool. So how do you start with something like this? Get, out, get away, Mallow Bites. So my creative process is just I talk about ideas all the time, and it's overwhelming to most of my friends, um, to find an emotional baseline that we can work with. So usually, um, all, all of my best ideas came from conversation, so they're not really mine. Uh, but it's, it starts with, wouldn't it be cool if this thing was made? And the responses can be, that's stupid, or meh, or that's pretty cool, or whoa. <laughs> and I gravitate towards, the woe, but also that stupid. Because really, like I, I, whatever it is I'm making, I just try to make sure that it's something I feel very strongly about. And when you're designing for emotion, your only enemy is indifference. So 
It's one example is a project I made, CyberSnake, for the Microsoft HoloLens. And wouldn't it be cool if you could play Snake in first person while you move your head around the room and eat stuff and dodge the tail growing off the back of your skull? Um, I talked about this with several of my friends, and the responses were that one, and which is why I made it. And it was pretty cool. And people had fun with it. And they moved around the room, and they engaged with the environment in a new way. And they had a very strange, ridiculous relationship in which they felt like children again. So we found that ridiculous childlike feeling, and now that we have that baseline, we can amplify it. So one of the silliest key things that I learned is that initially I was trying to make the game e like easier to play. I didn't place the little burgers too far away from you or too low into the ground um, so that you, you would, would, would be forced to like literally lie down. And people were having fun, but they were not having as much fun. But as soon as we forced them to climb on furniture and to get on the ground and sometimes like get, get on their knees to reach out to certain, um, certain objectives, the whole dynamic changed. The relationship became so much more playful. And the first time, people would always feel a little bit like, uh, is, is this OK? Like, I've never had a piece of software tell me to do this before. But the outcome was always a laugh. And that kind of bond was um, what we were going for. We made the relationship that more meaningful. And three principles that I always follow with amplifying emotion, and one is increasing physicality. So people feel more strongly towards things they can interact with, which is why six degrees of freedom is so important. Um, and in case of uh, with CyberSnake, we forced people to climb on furniture, so we increased physicality and made the whole relationship much more um, stronger. Multisensorial feedback. So if you're not using haptics and sound and visuals and anything else you have at your, at your disposal, you're minimizing your ability to create emotional output or to make people really feel more strongly about the things that are happening. And the building up of the relationship will come especially um, useful with the crying part. And emphasizing agency, which is often overlooked. If you want people to feel about the choices they're making, be it small things on, on like, how do I approach this particular burger? Uh, is it going to be like by crouching or climbing on my couch? Um, when you emphasize agency and you tell that you have the choice to do whatever it is you're doing, you feel that much more strongly about everything that you do and your relationship with the product or whatever it is you're making deepens, which is why it's harder for you to build really, really strong relationships with things that are mostly passive. Um, you will build relationships, but they will be a little bit weaker. So emphasizing physicality and feedback and make sure that you, the, the user always feels like they have agency unless you have a clear purpose for which they don't have agency, which can be used as a, as a narrative device, is great. So on crying, where thoughts go, for those that don't know um, where thoughts go, if, if this video ever loads, it's a, it's, it's a social, it is not loading. Well, so, just a second. So where thoughts go, it's a, it's, a, it's a social narrative set in a universe where human thoughts exist in as, as sleeping creatures. So you travel through these multiple landscapes in which you're surrounded by these little um, sleeping orbs. Each one of them is a voice message left by another person who was there before you were. You can wake up to these creatures to listen to the stories that people chose to share. And to move forward from chapter to chapter, from world to world, you need to put your hands together, you re and record a voice message of your own by giving birth to a creature, and you leave it, leave it behind for other people to find. And each one of the chapters, it actually has a prompt. So we ask people about their childhood dreams and very personal subjects. And as you progress through the narrative, you open up more and more, and the questions become more profound. So the whole narrative experience is really you opening up with the rest of the world until something happens at the end. And I really like this concept, and I had no idea if it was going to work. Most of us have assumptions on how people behave on, on the internet. And the main challenge was that we had to build a relationship of trust with everyone who was walking in. Like, we're literally trusting that people were going to put on a headset, walk into these fic fictional worlds, and just pour their dreams, thoughts, and experiences into it. And some of it is actually stuff that's so personal that uh, many people have approached us later and said, I wouldn't ha I said things that I don't tell my closest friends. So getting to that is hard, and we, ne we knew that every single aspect, visual, sound, interactions, um, 
and haptics would have to feed into that idea of trust. So things move very predictably. The creatures, they have the proportions of babies, so you feel uh, parental towards them. The environments, they have soft colors, and the music, it's soothing, and it was sung mostly. Um, it's, it's, it's mostly vocal, and it's all in, within the frequencies of a mother's voice. So every single thing emphasizes that this is a world you can trust, and this is a world you're in control, and this is a world in which you're talking to real people um, and listening to real things that have importance. And playfulness was actually something that wasn't immediately intuitive, but allowing people to just grab thoughts and throw them around or mess with the letters in the prompt, which you can do, and just do silly things, it's a huge icebreaker. When you walk into a world and you, anything you touch reacts to you and you can play with anything and you can break it and it was designed to be broken, automatically you're like, oh, this software is my friend. We can, we can do silly things together. And that breakdown of the initial shields that people bring into the experience, it allows us to build trust and create a world in which it's okay for people to share really intimate things. And we amplify, again, emotions by following those principles. Every single interaction is physical. There's no pointers anywhere. Um, I hate pointers. It's, it's, the, it's like the coldest relationship you could possibly have with content, and VR is riddled with them. Um, Everything gives you multisensorial feedback, so recording vibrates the controller in a very particular way, listening to thoughts um, changes, the, uh, vibrates the controller. If you grab a thought while someone's speaking, the controller vibrates to, to the frequencies of the sound you're listening to, so you actually feel like you're holding someone. So that, all that feedback really gets you in a certain emotional state, and it helps you forget that you're not in a real place. And agency. You can spend as much time as you want in each chapter. You can listen to as many people as you want. You choose when you record. You choose when you deliver. You choose when you want to move forward to the next one. Every single little bit of the experience was designed to maximize agency. There's nothing that we force the person to do, which means if you want to, if you want to say horrible things and be a troll, you can. But we make sure that this is your choice. And we designed the narrative ambiguously so even the trolls would get a proper ending. Um, it's, it, it, it'll make sense for those who try it out. Um, but yeah, really telling people that this is your world and you can do whatever you want and we're not forcing you to do anything. And we also um, built an installation to maximize those emotions and that made so much difference. It was built by Dara, who's, who's back there, and she's amazing. And it's, it's like we showed this at a couple of open showroom floors and people wouldn't, they weren't capable of going past like chapter one or they wouldn't able to say anything because they felt like they were being observed or sometimes they would say things but when people weren't in an installation versus in an open floor where everyone can see them, the thoughtfulness of their interactions, everything changed. Is the microphone down? Well, I'll project, oh, okay. So, yeah, and so the, the installation also helped amplify those emotions and those feelings. And, all the and once you have established a relationship, and once that relationship is strong, and once this relationship is personal, and you're in a place you can trust, and you've given the user all that comfort, you can take it away when they least expect it. And that's what we do right around chapter four. Some people cry earlier. Um, but on, on, uh, there's, um, we, we use the first three chat, uh, chapters to create a pattern. So after you listen to every single message, little thought, it floats away up in the sky. And the thoughts in the beginning, they tend to be a little bit more hopeful and happy. On chapter four, we talk about uh, things that are a little bit sadder. And after you listen to each person, it's actually the thought doesn't go up, but it falls on the ground and it rolls away. I had a video, but Wi-Fi is down. Um, and we tried to Again, like amplify emotion. We weren't designing this to be the crying chapter. It just became the crying chapter because people cried in it. And once we realized that, we were like, okay, let's amplify that. So we made the thoughts fall away and roll down the hill um, just so people could feel more anguish. And there's something about, there's something about seeing cute things um, suffer when you can't do anything um, <laughs> to stop it that really makes you feel something. Pixar does that very well. Um, which is why actually personifying the things you're interacting with, make sure that they feel living and 
making sure that they have a personality, it also helps you um, feel sad and it helps you cry. And really what I'm trying to get at with this whole thing is XR is really, it's, it's about building, it's, it's about building, the, the products that I think that are gonna conquer the world are the ones that care about this relationship, that care about emotion. These, these are the products that will delight people and make people feel things they've never felt before. And when you're trying to find out what's next in XR, and most of the, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening, but most of the stuff that you see happening in the commercial world is stuff that has been talked about since the 80s. Um, when, you want, when you want to find out what's next, I trust emotions, and I trust that they will really show me the way to the things that are valuable and the things that are worth making. And it's really the, it's an opportunity for us to build a better internet, an internet that's actually more, um, that's not only immersive and sensorial, but it really, it's, it's designed to connect us at a, at a deeper level, not only with other people, but with, with the software that's around us. And yeah, with that in mind, I have some time for questions. So thank you for your time. I, Where Thoughts Go actually is going to be available tomorrow in early access on the Oculus Store. Uh, we will be in uh, other VR platforms, but I'm like, I'm, I'm the only developer, so please. I, it's, it's, it's so much work. Uh, but yeah, you, you, can, you can try it out. And I would love to answer some of your questions, and thank you so much for your time. So, are there questions? Where? Oh, here. Oh, hell yeah. Um, is it, um, are you like selling them on Oculus or are they, uh, or is it like a free app? I am selling it because I got tired of making things for free, even though I've done it for a very long time. And it's, you know, in the beginning you're like, I care about this so much, I want everyone to play it, but then after a year and a half that kind of goes away. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions? I'm sorry, I might have missed this. Uh, so how did you come up with the stories that the characters share? Is oh, people. Uh, it's all user generated. Oh. We don't write anything. That's part of the charm. Um, it's, it's, a, it's always growing and it's always changing and every single person has a different experience than the previous and all of the stories are told by users. Where do they share them? So throughout the experience, um, if you, there's, when you go into a world, you have the opportunity to listen to all the messages around you. And I'm sorry I couldn't show the video, but um, at the end, at the, bottom, at the bottom right, it's to move forward, they need to put their hands together and give birth to a creature and tell it their own message. And then, and then they leave it behind for other people to find. So the mechanic is you take by listening to other people's intimate stories, but you have to give to move forward. And so you record it and turn it into text or? That's it's audio. Be, it's audio. Okay. Yeah, when they wake up, they speak to you, and they they move to the um, to um, they move according to to the, to the sound to be spoken. So um, all the animations are procedurally generated depending on what the person's saying. Oh, cool. thank you. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear before. I was hoping the video would clear it up. Uh, hey, I'm building uh, my own VR experience, and curious. I thought Unity was the one that's supposed to help you with putting on different platforms. So what are the challenges when you have to deploy on different VR headsets? Okay. Um, there's lots of, the problem is that I like to do things not just, uh, I'm a perfectionist to a fault and that's really painful. It's a really painful existence to be a perfectionist, especially in this field and when you're doing like everything. Um, and having to, to communicate with, it. when you're launching something, you want to be able to, you want to coordinate with the Oculus team and the, the guys from Steam, and you want to coordinate with Microsoft and Microsoft Store, and kind of like create a core join marketing effort as the same time as you're dealing with all the engineering um, nightmare that you have to, and supporting these multiple platforms. So walking into this, I didn't know how many variables were at play, or how many things you have to actually get done at the same time. So that's one of the challenges, is making sure that you can not only port over to multiple platforms, and there's tools that are making this easier every day, but also build the relationships inside of each one of those companies, Oculus, Microsoft, and Steam, so you can actually do a coordinated launch. launch. Um, 
and try to support all these things at the same time. And each one of them has their own process and submission uh, to submit products to the store. So I guess that will be it. I'm, I hope that answers your question. It's it's like two days of work, so it's 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 annoying, but it's not. I wouldn't say it's a huge challenge. Um, I'm talking about these mostly because those are the issues that I have been facing personally, right now. Hi, hey, Lucas. Uh, what brought you to making this concept? Like, was it a curiosity? Was it your own feelings at the time? Like, what were you going through when you came up with this? So people are Im immensely emotionally complex. I think everyone is, and we often don't see that. We, um, we often look at ourselves as having stronger or superior or um, more in-depth emotions than everyone else. So I wanted to create something that proves people wrong, but not, but not as me showing something to people, but letting people show that to the world, letting the community speak for themselves. Um, so I really wanted to do that, and I love storytelling and technology, and I wanted to create an experience that forced people to do something that technology has, doesn't make them do, um, which is open up about really intimate stuff in, in a public um, forum in VR. And yeah, those were some of my motivations. Also, the internet is way too cold of a place, and I think that the people misbehave on the internet not because people are people, but because we design the internet badly. It's, a, it's, it's the designer's fault, it's not the people's fault. Now that you've devoted yourself to this, and it's beautiful and gorgeous, do you have the next one in mind? Yes, um, I do. That's like my answer. <laughs> One last question, then I have one too. Okay. Please go. Uh, so this game reminds me a lot of Journey in the sense that you're interacting with strangers in an anonymous way, but you've experimented with lots of different experiences. So have you found um, a thread of emotional attachment in your other designs which don't involve creating stranger interactions? So what's, uh, sorry, what was the question exactly? No, sorry. Um, in this game, the emotional hook is that you're getting strangers to interact about deeply personal things, much like in the game Journey, you're mm -hmm. interacting yes. with a stranger. So my question is, um, that's the thread of where the emotion comes in this app. Have you had other apps that also evoke strong emotion but don't use that as a hook? Is there any like consistent theme that you've found across your projects? Um, no, it changes wildly. Um, I get bored really easily, and that's part of those. It's a good thing. It's also a problem. Um, but it's it's as in making people like finding um, as the hook being central to your interactions with other people. That's something I have been playing with a lot, and I want to do more stuff with it. Um, but it's like there's no. It's the, the only the only really sh aspect that all of my projects share is that they mean to make people feel something new for the first time. I hope that answers your question. I have a last question, yes. personal question, because I've been working with museums for many years, um, ranging from contemporary art museum, tech museum, science museum, art museum, and they love AR and VR because they give the possibility to build uh, installations, physical installations around them. What um, Do you think that uh, using this one, th this uh, experience, in a, um, in a location-based uh, uh, perspective, you know, in, in, a, in a certain night, in a certain place, and then you start collecting the thoughts of the people that are attending an event. And do you think it would be different when you will put this thing online and so maybe the database will populate more, but it will lose some of its intimacy and... Uh, so it, it would lose intimacy if it's online? I'm, I, I fear that. So we, um, right when the experience starts, we tell you to like, be alone in a room. That's the number one thing. If you feel alone and you feel un unobserved, you will be way more thoughtful and way kinder and like, just not only more interesting, but you will be a better person. It's really strange. If you have someone else in your room, even if it's a friend or someone close, you start, you, it's less about you interacting with software and it's more about you interacting with software as you perform to the other people in the room. 
And that changes everything. Um, it's like quantum physics, observing changes the outcome. Um, so it's as long as people are alone in a room, you won't lose intimacy. If there's people in a room, yes, it completely changes the game. Um, we want to do location-based, and we are going to do location-based. We have a couple of events next month that we um, that we're going to be doing that. It's like the experience is only people who are at the event, and we're going to be doing and, this and at AWE. Location based, to an you start from an empty space. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's great. And I am. I have one engineering thing I have to do today. Maybe we'll be doing that tomorrow at the playground. Uh, we have a booth at the playground. No promises. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to, to finish something so we could do that. So everything that you hear is from AWE. Thank you very much, Lucas. It was Thank so you. inspiring. Thank you. Thanks.